then the genetics of that will get, I think, will become more and more important. And then it'll be saying, okay, what can we do as we look at, at production traits that actually have to do in terms of now of health traits as well? And I think that there's been some trade off there. Uh, and the the microbiome piece of it is it really, it really you know, I think is very important because that's the, one of the drivers in terms of what happens in terms of how those epithelial cells are going to respond. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson, and I'm the host of the podcast. Joining me on our episode this week is Dr. Chris Chase. Dr. Chase is a professor of veterinary and biomedical science at South Dakota State University. Chris, thank you very much for joining us on the, pro- the podcast this week. Oh, glad to be here. Chris, you're a pretty uh, a well-regarded immunologist, um, and uh, I'm sure that uh, you don't need any introduction, but just in case there's some folks out there that maybe haven't haven't seen you speak or aren't familiar with your work, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do and what your area of expertise is? Oh, sure. So I'm, I'm originally from South Dakota. I have not ventured very far from, uh, uh, I grew up 100 miles north of here in, in a town called Sisseton. And uh, I was uh, fortunate uh, to, to go to actually the SDSU to do my pre-vet. Uh, I went to Iowa State. Uh, to get my DVM. Uh, and then I was very fortunate. The first practice I was in was in Vibrook, South Dakota. And I worked for uh, Dr. Ron Lockwood there, who was just a tremendous uh, innovator uh, in swine medicine. And I, I feel I was really fortunate that I, I got to start out with him. But then uh, then my career, uh, sort of interesting. This is, So in, in, the, it was in the mid-80s, I went back to grad school and at that time, it was just easier to get funded to work on a cattle project than it was a swine project. Now, I would tell you, the thing is, things have changed. But uh, at that time, so I went back to the University of Wisconsin and got my uh, my PhD, my master's and PhD uh, in immunology and virology, actually basically looking at uh, uh, herpes viruses, actually in cattle, for so IBR. Uh, and then I uh, went from there to uh, work two years, actually, in uh, for – uh, the Agricultural Research Service for USDA uh, on blue tongue, and then uh, got the chance to come back to SVSU in '92, and that was when PERS was really, uh, you know, understanding that Dave Benfield was here at that time, and I got to uh, do that. And, and the other thing that I, from almost uh, well, from from when I graduated in '80, I always want to keep myself in clinical practice. So even when I came back here and all the way through grad school, I was I was involved in clinical practice. So I actually worked in the practice south of here until 2009, and that was actually a lot with swine herd health. So um, I got to see circle virus you know, for the first time and all that kind of good stuff too. So so I've so I've had you know, both a, an academic career, but at the same time important to to be involved in things clinically. Oh, and on top of that, on, on top of that, I also have a clinical research company uh, that we started that that does lots of uh, immuno uh, vaccine research in swine and cattle and poultry. So, Farm Health Guardian is a proven biosecurity software system that helps you improve compliance and reduce disease risk. Why choose Farm Health Guardian? Automate downtime and health status management for large systems. Get biosecurity breach alerts for trucks and trailers. Prevent unauthorized access to your barns with controlled entry technology and speed up disease investigations with automated traceback reports. Check out what our customers are saying at farmhealthguardian.com. Well, little did you know, Chris, you didn't have to go to the decades of schooling and get all that practical experience to be an immunologist. You could have just lived through COVID on Twitter and you would be an immunologist, right? You'd know everything about how the immune system functions and vaccine works and all that. And in all seriousness, Chris, you might talk to us about like um, the, the association with inflammation and immunity gut health, CNS. Um, there's a lot of interconnected parts in that web. How do you as a researcher start to like tease that apart? How's it all work together? Well, I mean, the interesting thing is, is I, I was really strictly a bug guy until about 2008. And it was actually uh, giving, I was asking about a talk at AASV uh, sort of on, on on gut interaction, and that totally flipped <laughs> well the way I was looking at things. So I became much more much more host related in terms of especially working with macrophages uh, and in, and inflammation, and then just beginning to understand then, especially with in the gut, 
about how important the the epithelial cells of the gut and as are the respiratories and the, the epithelial cells of the respiratory tract in terms of how important they are as immune cells and how uh, they're they're being regulated uh, in terms of uh, trying to have the least amount of inflammation, which makes sense in terms of not wanting to have leaky gut and being able to then understand, okay, that's now we're talking about microbiome. Uh, we're talking about an interaction between these epithelial cells that in the past, we just talked about their importance on the nutrition basis in terms of secretion or absorption. But in fact, they are, uh, they are the, the, as far as I'm concerned, the most important thing in the immune system. And then it's gotten, you know, it's gotten more interesting because we've, you know, we've seen this with COVID, but we've actually understood this for, I think, a lot longer time with, with poor, poor sun respiratory disease that we knew that it was, I mean, often it's, it was stress induced, uh, you know, and, and you would have, you know, often you would have a virus involved and then there would be a bacteria. So we've seen that on the veterinary side for a long time. And then just COVID sort of brought it, brought it home in terms of on, on the human side. But the, again, the importance of inflammation, and I think you know what we learned, and I think unfortunately, maybe we we when we look at livestock, one of the things is we developed the genetics to in, in enhance productivity. At the same time, we've actually had some effect, I think, on inflammatory uh, markers and on, on inflammatory pathways. And so I think you, you know there's there's been some interesting work, and I can say this on the cow side, not so much on the swine side, but we actually they looked at older genetics, some Holsteins that from back in the '60s. And compared their inflammatory response to you know today's Holsteins, of course today's Holsteins produce about a third more, and yet what causes a cow now to tip over? Basically, uh, the, the cow with the '60s genetics, she just looks at it and sneezes. So, I, and and I and I think you know on, on the hog side, we've probably done the same thing that we've. Uh, I think you know the diseases that we that we have seen that typically, I mean, these were diseases that or bugs that have been around. Uh, like the Ptilobacillus suus and then some other things that have been around for a long time. And the next thing you know, now they're a problem. And, I, and so, I think, so I think our understanding of inflammation uh, and, and again, then the genetics of that will get, I think will become more and more important. And then it'll be saying, okay, what can we do as we look at, at, at production traits that actually have to do in terms of now of health traits as well. And I think that there's been some trade off there. Uh, and the the microbiome piece of it is it really it really uh, you know I think is very important because that's the, one of the drivers in terms of what happens in terms of how those epithelial cells are going to respond. And then the other thing again, the cell that we've spent most of my career on the macrophage has gone from just being sort of a, a cell that's the sentinel to now we know that that in fact in the gut macrophages themselves are actually giving the signals to the neurons to actually make gut motility. And, and, and so, you know, we, we've gone, we've gone from just, so, okay, okay. They're like, they're like a fire alarm sentinel to being, in fact, no, they are in, incredibly important. And then the, you know, the other thing is how these systems are all connected. So, I mean, you have respiratory disease, can I actually result in leaky gut and vice versa? And the answer is absolutely. And I think that's that's another thing that we've learned. And, and I think we learned that from COVID. But I mean, we I think we knew that before. We just didn't necessarily put things together. So uh, the fact that, you know, again, that you have inflammation in one part of the body, it doesn't just stay there. There's a systemic effect. And then that systemic effect is going to result then in health issues uh, in, in other systems. And so being able to make that work is uh, – uh, is is you know and and then and then on the other piece of that is that the immune system is so affected by stress and it's pretty hard to say what's not stressful <laughs> okay so in the in the in the in the in the you know both in terms of the environments that we raise animals in and and in, you know and and in the less handling that we can do uh and all those and all those other kind of things that come in there and then you know and then trying to even those diets out and it, it, it's in it, i mean it's a it's a it's, you know, it's a fun time i'm i'm actually gonna go into emeritus status at, at the end of june but uh i'm i, I won't be out of the picture because i i i enjoy where this is going because it's it's an exciting time salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans as the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. 
Well, if you're passionate about it, right, you will you will enjoy it and continue to do it for forever. And certainly there's a need for it. As we think, uh, Chris, about how to handle these critters, you know, cattle, pigs, et cetera, that are amazing performers, but maybe a little on the sensitive side when it comes to stress, health challenges, et cetera. Um, if you could fix the microbiome or the genetic side, which do you think is more important to the overall negative outcome for disease? If I gave you the magic wand to fix one or the other, would you have a preference or do you think they're so interrelated that like, yeah, making one pick, making one better would help, but pick one, it's random. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm gonna throw a third thing at you, okay? <laughs> and that's environment, okay? So one of the things that we've done to pigs is we've taken them totally out of the environment that they were in before. And I, and I think one of the things when it comes to at least inflammation, you know, our understanding in terms of certainly both in terms of microbiome, but parasites, you know, something that we don't even think about really very much anymore uh, on the human side. I mean, there's actually therapeutics where the therapeutic is to give them parasites. Okay. And I, and I think that conditioning that animals got from parasites i mean we need to think about how can we mimic that i think so so you know that's you know the whole idea because you know i started out early enough that i saw lots of pigs on dirt and uh and and then you know and then and then you had all all those, all those issues with that but i mean i i think there's things that that are part of development that are in the environment of you know that's that that in the past we just we didn't understand it. Okay, I think that's the best way to say it. And so how we could actually pieces and so it's probably a little bit more to do with microbiome, um, I, you know, or at least exposure, whatever whatever that looks like. And you know, there's a that, you know the whole hygiene hypothesis is based on you know what you're exposed to and then how that then influences you for the rest of your life. And that's absolutely true for pigs as well. And I think and I and I think maybe you know again some of the issues that we have are because pigs are not exposed to things they were before. And therefore, guess what? That that sensitivity or that uh, resistance that they normally would have, it's just not there because they were conditioned to see that. So to me, that's 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 kind of a big black box in the swine industry is to understand that a little bit. Because it, the thing that you think about how we raise poultry and how we raise cow, they're still they're still in an environment where they they're having that kind of exposure, but. But uh, uh, so they say, see dirt. They see a lot of other things that we don't see in the swine industry. So, yep. You know, you bring up a great point with the environment. There are things we can tweak that uh, we still today just measure with kind of crude performance measurements. So we make a tweak to the environment. We measure the average daily gain. We measure the mortality to see if it's good or bad. But from an inflammation standpoint, are we able to measure the immune system better today and to a point where we can look at maybe biomarkers or more predictive type markers of success or failure when it comes to inflammation versus waiting for the outcome from the pig on performance? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really good question. And, you know, and the, and the big thing that I think that you know, people don't realize or in, in Lance Baumgard at Iowa State has done some really good work with this, just showing you about how much how much inflammation, how much uh, how, he has this great picture of holding, I don't know if you've ever seen the bag of sugar, about how much how much how much glucose that, that the immune system burns up. And so, so, the, so the product, you know, the production, we clearly know that there's a, there's an outcome, but you, you know, the, they're trying to get the markers of the predictors. There's, you know, there's some, there's some work under underway. I, I you know, and, and I can say I'm a little bit more familiar with the work done and look at the inflammasomes. So it's looking at, okay, so what kind of things that we can measure? I mean, I can tell you a crude thing that, that we have, you know, that we have looked at that I think has some, some, uh, Validity, and that is actually doing differential counts and look at eosinophils because eosinophils, which we think of, okay, strictly kind of on the parasitic side, but in fact, they are a good indicator of an anti inflammatory response. And we know that animals that have a stronger anti inflammatory response are going to probably, are going to, you know, are going to be more productive uh, and they're going to be more healthy. And, and, that, and which kind of goes away. And, and again, we're not talking about high levels of eosinophils, but eosinophils are normally at a pretty low level anyway. And so if instead of zero, to one percent, or one or two percent. Those animals, interestingly enough, and this is most of work has been done in cattle. There's something in swine as well. Typically, well, they have less respiratory disease. I'll have less rest, but but we, but we don't have. You know, there's been a lot of people that have looked at acute phase proteins and 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 those kind of things. Trying to and there, and I think the swine world has done a better job than that than anybody. I'll be very honest with you. The work that's been done in Spain and other places, but still. We're, you know, we're struggling to say, okay, this is, you know, if, if, if we see this and, and we can do this intervention, 
bingo. And we're, you know, and we're not there, but, but at least uh, when you look at acute phase proteins, you I mean, it's, it's a relatively easy sample to measure. You can run a lot of them. And I think, again, the work from Spain, to me, at least that's been, uh, you know, a place where it looks like they've done a pretty good job of saying, okay, if we know if we can, this, we see this kind of level, we can probably predict that this is what we're going to see in terms of the end product. So, but unfortunately, yeah, I, no, I don't have a magic bullet for your magic test. Well, we'll bring you back on for the next podcast once that gets developed. How about that? There you go. Yeah. Yeah. The, the field of immunology is certainly a daunting one for novices like myself when we get into it. I really appreciate, Chris, you coming on. And I know it's a hard subject to kind of give us a high level overview in a short amount of time. Yeah. But you do a wonderful job of explaining it. And I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts, not only on where we're at today with modern genetics and the good and the bad with that, um, but also, you know, what the future holds for us as we try to better utilize those modern genetics, the same as we did when pigs were on dirt, right? Our job is just to make it a little bit better every day. So thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. To our audience, thank you very much for joining Chris and I. Um, if you haven't checked out the website, please go to swinehealthblackbelt.com and take a look there and subscribe to the podcast so that you don't miss out on our great episodes coming out every Friday. For Dr. Chris Chase, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thanks for joining us and have a great rest of your day.